recording uh, traditional areas uh, that had been used for hunting, trapping, and fishing, and we need to collect this material while we still have some elderly people among us. We lived along the northeastern seaboard of what is now Canada and the United States. Our territory included a domain of islands. We mastered the sea long before European contact. Many years ago, our family started to stay in Newfoundland year-round, where we hunted, gathered, and fished. This continues today. The terms pre-contact and prehistory often suggest native people had fixed primitive societies. In the pre-Columbian period, rather, the Americas possessed a rich history. Evidence shows many First Nations had relationships with other indigenous peoples. They traded and shared territory, language, and culture. Why would we assume it impossible for the Mi'kmaq to be inspired to explore in the same way as the Europeans? A ship known as the HMS Grace of Bristol, which is the first known English voyage to the western coast of Newfoundland, mentions Indians in St. George's Bay in 1594. The Mi'kmaq in Newfoundland are not mentioned directly in the writings of any Europeans, however, until 1640, when they are described as similar to Indians of Cape Breton. In 1720, Eliphas Upton notes that a few Mi'kmaqs settled at St. George's Bay on the southwest coast of Newfoundland. 18th century Newfoundland remained as she had always been a fundamentally maritime colony, one giant fishing vessel anchored off the continental coast. I'm Calvin White. I'm from uh, here in the community of Flat Bay. My involvement with the project goes back about two years now. Uh, the chief approached me and asked me if I would take on a project to uh, review and research the uh, land use and occupancy of the uh, Flat Bay Indian Band Council. I came back to the council and said, yeah, you know, I'm going to need some workers, I'm going to need some assistance to do this. It's much more of a project than one person would be able to take on. First, let me tell you, the, uh, I guess, the, the importance of doing the project. The, the history of, uh, of our community and our people had never been recorded, as far as we understood. We, we looked everywhere. We didn't find any written documentation anywhere. And, uh, and talking to elderly people in the community, we realized that this type of, uh, of work had never been done. We realized that uh, future generations need to know something about the history of, uh, of themselves and uh, of their people and of the community. Uh, and what we did is we targeted the elderly people uh, in the Bay St. George area with the mind that we, uh, that we might lose them very soon. So we, uh, we concentrated on the most elderly. Mary Elsa Dale Young. I interview people uh, that lived on Sandy Point to try to find a connection between Sandy Point and Flat Bay. Some of the questions were, did they meet any people coming from Flat Bay to Sandy Point either to pick up squid along the shore or if they bought meats or berries from people from Flat Bay, if they knew of any Indians that may have lived on Sandy Point. I met a lady named Evelyn Butler and she had told me a particular story about Joe Paul. And she had said that uh, Joe Paul came to Caroline Butler's one day and Caroline asked if, she, if he had any bake apples to sell. And he said, no, not today, ma'am, he said, because I had to go to the dentist. So she said, well, made you stomach sick, did it, by going to the dentist? And he said, no, I can't shuck the berries no more. And it was quite a laugh. But I was really surprised with uh, Goldie Hollett. Uh, she had mentioned that the people from Flat Bay used to go to Sandy Point to sell baskets. That was a surprise. I was really proud of that. People from Flat Bay used to go to Sandy Point to dances and they dated girls and the girls dated, you know, the boys from over there and intermarriages started then. Everyone is related. <laughs> That's the surprise. If you go back a couple generations, you are related to everyone on the West Coast. If you think you're not related, you're wrong. My name is Haley Burrows. I'm a researcher, editor, compiler, writer, anything else that needs doing. And I did the genealogy, which was looking through people's family trees, tracing them back from current day to the 1500s. Uh, after that, we started working on the main document. There's definitely further work to be done. One year was nowhere near enough time to 
collect, look for, and really peruse all the information available. I was given one year to try and form a community-wide family tree. Basically, the Benoit family tree has mostly been compiled, but all the major families besides that still need a lot more work. The Benoit family tree has the most information available because Jason Benoit did a lot of that. The Lejeunes, the Youngs, have the next most available information. Everyone else, you need to go look at church records, which are in Nova Scotia, in order to get the full depth of that. As for more work beyond that, there's archaeology that needs to be looked into, and if this is a land use and occupancy study working towards a land claim, there's still lots more information to be found. My name is Ivan White. I'm from here in Flat Bay, but I currently live in St. George's. I'm the traditional land use and occupancy study project coordinator. Basically, I was the person who handled the focus of the project. If we ever went off the rails, it was my job to make sure that we were following the mandate. It wasn't all of my vision, but my job was to maintain the vision of the traditional land use and occupancy study. Uh, a lot of it was files here in the band office and what uh, Elder Calvin White had at his house that he had collected over the years from different, I wouldn't say land use studies, but at least um, ethno histories and genealogy work that had been done for the FNI from the 70s and the 80s and Con River. Actually, there was one surprise that I had never heard of and the canoes that the Mi'kmaq use had a raised gunnel and so did the Beothic and I thought, okay, that's, that's kind of different. It was only those two canoes had raised gunnels and they were meant for the ocean. If those two people were never in contact before Europeans arrived, how did they have the same canoe? Why do you need an ocean-going canoe if Mi'kmaq never came across an ocean? But we know they came across an ocean because they went from New Brunswick to PEI to... They had a, a domain of islands, which included the Magdalen Islands, St. Paul Island, which is only like 68 kilometers from Newfoundland. And so the fact that those canoes are the same, I think, establishes that we were here. By 1850, a clear image of Sandy Point as a settlement emerges, with number of inhabitants at a thousand, English, French, Canadian and Indian, according to a fisheries report. When English control of the area became prevalent, new settlers eventually pushed many Mi'kmaq people to a permanent residence on the shores opposite Sandy Point, thereby establishing a codependent relationship that still exists to this day. Starting with the changes in occupation, the Mi'kmaq people essentially stopped living in small patchwork villages, although some resisted and chose to live in more secluded locations. A few periodically left the established communities to hunt and fish the interior. Any younger men who traveled to those locations without the older people they put names onto it themselves that are not the traditional names. And what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to collect the information so I can put the actual traditional names onto it. Originally, the body of water spanning from the main gut and continuing south of the Sandy Point Isthmus to Young's Cove was known as Flat Bay. The establishment of Flat Bay as a community, known to the Greater Bay St. George area, didn't happen until the turn of the 20th century. At this time, Flat Bay would have only been connected to outside communities by way of train, boat, or walking trail through rough terrain. Once the rail system was established at the beginning of the 20th century, people began to migrate to the opposite shore in earnest. Three train stations, Fishel's, St. Teresa's, and Muddy Hole, would be created between the borders of Flat Bay and Fishel's rivers. This would act as access points for people, goods, and services in and out of Flat Bay for nearly 70 years. Started in the 1930s, Main Road was one of the first community initiatives undertaken by the people of Flat Bay. It connected Flat Bay East, also known as Money Hole, to Jeunot's. They cut a swath along the shore, on trails and cow paths, eventually giving way to the current road and automobiles. From walking paths and waterways to rail and roads, Flat Bay moved from complete isolation to being connected to the rest of Newfoundland. This had its blessings and its hindrances. 
A community that was once totally independent and self-policed became subject to outside rules and regulations. The Mi'kmaq heritage of the community comes from the people who established families and populated the area we now know as Flat Bay. They gave us a community and we would like to show our appreciation by acknowledging them here. There is a, a very strong argument for a land claims issue for the people of, uh, of Flat Bay. Without that documentation, uh, without the recorded documentation and the evidence of our history, we would not be in any position to talk to uh, you know, multinational corporations who may very well find themselves here, whether it's for drilling for oil or potash or salt or any other major development that may take place uh, on what we consider to be the homelands of the Flat Bay people. This project could certainly, uh, uh, you know, could undergo another six to eight months of research in order to do a very thorough job. Absolutely, there's a lot more work to be done because we've only touched the uh, the surface of what was hundreds and hundreds of hours. We ran out of time. Uh, we look at it as a preliminary study supporting our belief and uh, and we need to have it analyzed by you know by academics and by legal people to determine uh, what else if anything else needed to be done or uh, or are we just uh, dreaming we maintain that we are beneficiaries of the 1726 treaty we maintain we are members of the Mi'kmaq Grand Council 7th District. We maintain that Flat Bay has had and continues to have membership with the national body currently known as the Assembly of First Nations. We maintain that we have not ceded or negotiated away our rights to a land claim. Though modern life caught up to us and we had to stop relying solely on the land, you can still see images of the past in how we hunt and forage. Driving into this community is like stepping back in time. Most of the people are aware and proud of their Mi'kmaq heritage. We have a chief instead of a mayor, a band office instead of a town council. We will continue to research and document our way of life and our culture so that the future generations will have an understanding of the history and heritage of Flat Bay.